So that's Scott Kiston, the aforementioned Scott, who's a founder and chairman of Tyra, as I mentioned, and also, of course, senior vice president at Muni. And by the force of his vision, we have seen him become a national leader on, on apprenticeships, not just for our industry, but across many different industries and serving as an expert at the Department of Labor for them to develop programs for the entire country. Marty Travers from Black and Beach, uh, who is a great member of PCIA, is the president, uh, which is he's focused on, on uh, deployment of wireless and wireline telecommunications network and facilities. Uh, Marty's been a visionary in training, has gotten Black and Beach out front on a lot of these efforts that we'll hear about, including our own efforts at PCIA. Kelly Dunn is a, the current president and, and co-founder of Warriors for Wireless. He single-handedly started up the effort to bring veterans into our industry and has already got veterans coming in for all the right reasons. He's crisscrossed the country tirelessly to get the word out to, to recruit folks, to get companies involved, and, and done a great job. We're honored to have uh, Rosie Cloud with us from, uh, from the, formerly from the White House, uh, Policy Director for Veterans and Wounded Warriors and Military Families, and now she's a Senior Advisor of the Department of Veterans Affairs, where she's working on these issues and pioneering efforts to bring veterans into our workforce. Finally, Gemma Frock, who's Vice President of, of Education Training at Aiken Technical College in, in Aiken, South Carolina. She has developed a, a wireless infrastructure program at the college. It's really leading the nation on training tower climbers, and she's going to go further. She's won a federal grant for that, so she's helping to develop a model uh, for the whole country. We're great, grateful for, for Aiken and, and Gemma's focus on our industry. Well, I'll, I'll just take it from there and, and, and talk to the panelists, maybe uh, maybe the folks from, from industry, from Muni and, and, and Black and & Beach, about what are the needs that you're seeing uh, out in the workforce today? What, what are the sort of shortfalls and what is the problem we're trying to solve here? Well, I think one of the things that we have to take a look at is, as you were talking about, there was just $41 billion spent on Spectrum. That's a limited resource. There's, there's a limit to what can be done with it. So many times we talk just about the safety piece and miss out on what's critically important. That's the quality and nature of that work environment. If we plan our work and we're doing the work in a quality manner, we maximize the use of the spectrum, but we get the beautiful event of a safe work environment. And that's one of the things that we're looking for is how do we develop the skills necessary for people to perform quality work in a planned manner to ensure everybody's safe, not just the person working on the site, but the people that rely on the site every day. As you were talking about, we drive the industry. We're almost like the coal for the furnace of the economy. And in order to do that, we have to have our networks work every time, not just some of the time. Scott, you know, I think one of the, the keys for us is as the industry ebbs and flows with volume of workforce needed, it's very important for us to have a healthy industry across the board. And some of the things that we've tried to do from the safety aspect is really the idea of rising the tide in general across the industry because, you know, at Black & Beach we have our own self-performing craft crews that work, but we're also very dependent on a large subcontractor workforce. So we need to implement programs that will raise the collective competency both in technical and in safety areas across the whole industry because like you said, Jonathan, this industry collaborates a lot, and sometimes you're a client, and other times you're a customer, and you move back and forth. And a healthy industry that has a well-trained workforce is essential, and that training has to be very broad. Well, and that's where we've struggled with the industry is to remove some of the slime and establish a common vernacular. So what we're talking about in California can be what we're talking about in New York. If we don't have all the confusion over who does what, why, where, who's qualified for what. How do we know someone's qualified? And I think that's that's crucial, and it's uh, it's coming. The industry continues to evolve and get stronger in that regard. And organizations like we're talking about here with Warriors for Wireless and the other training efforts that are underway with TIRAP will help move that needle effectively. Well, you mentioned that it ebbs and flows, and uh, sometimes we're in an ebb in one part and flow in another. Uh, yeah. what, what are you seeing today in terms of uh, the, the shortages, and what do you think we're going to need tomorrow for the workforce in the future? Well, you, you talked earlier about small cells, and I think that's that's a different technology. You know, the, the industry responded when radio equipment moved to the top of the tower, and that required a little bit different skill set. I think as, as we move towards small cells at some pace, and, and different carriers are in different stages of deployment of small cells, but I'm confident 
that technology being out there. Um, it's a different skill set. It doesn't necessarily require the power climbing expertise, but it does require maybe a different technical expertise associated with configuring and um, those kind of aspects. And so um, I, what I like about this industry, and I think what attracts a lot of us to it, is that change continues and that applies to the technology, but it also applies to the workforce. And the workforce is going to have to change to become adaptable. And we don't do a lot of work out of bucket trucks necessarily today, but down the road we will. And we'll be working in a lot of public right away, a lot different than working inside a, a fenced in cell site where you have a little bit of control. So different um, expertise will be required. And I think that's what keeps people invigorated and keeps them attracted to this industry. You talked about the collaboration of the industry. We've got a limited number of structures right now that need to be modified to maximize the capacity on the structures. That's where you have NAE, TIA in particular, uh, the 1019A standard is going to evolve. It's going to turn into 322, 1048 to further help the industry maximize those resources that are available and convey to each party that's interested, whether it's the engineer, the owner, the contractor, what needs to be done to ensure that those structures can be modified in a safe and quality manner so we can get every last bit of equipment on a tower as possible in a way that the tower doesn't fail. Well, maybe you can tell us what TIRAP's doing to, to make that, that vision possible. I'm not really here familiar with the TIRAP. Well, I'll go back to David Zams really is, is a big help in what it started. And the issue was, how do we care enough about these people to make sure they understand what it is they're doing? There's been a lot of talk in the industry for years about we want people safe, we want people safe. David really wanted, as an owner, to tear down the walls and say, we need to quit talking about people being safe and make sure they understand that explanation, they understand the desire for quality. And what we're doing is we're seeking to work with two primary goals. One, set the credentialing requirements, whether you're in the apprenticeship program or not, because to your point, we need a common vernacular. All the changes of vernacular across the industry, is it a tower foreman, is it a tower god, is it a tower dog, is it a tower this or that. We need to get to where there's a common vernacular so people know who's qualified to do what work. Second thing is we need to facilitate working with people like TIA, PCIA, NAEP, OSHA, ANSI, so that we can make sure we're all communicating from the same playbook. Whether you're in the apprenticeship or not, some way of having consistency so that people like Kelly Dunn and what he's doing and the passion he's got to bring veterans to work, they can have an opportunity for a career instead of just a job. So, so how does Tyrock work? I'm not sure if you understand sort of the basics of, of, of uh, It's a board that was assembled. It's got tower owners, carrier involvement, uh, contractors, engineers came together so that we could work with the Department of Labor in a joint venture. And what we're doing is we're seeking to credential the positions for different levels. We're looking at the people that work on the towers. We're looking at the people that do site active zoning. We're looking at people that do cellular technician work. How do we credential those? We get the position credential. Somebody can use that if they want to be in the apprenticeship program or not. And they use that to be able to set a career path for the people that are seeking to develop in our industry. It allows a career path to be created. It's good. Yeah, Marty, you've done a lot to let Black and Beach and lead the way to the Tower Safety Task Force and other efforts. Maybe you can talk about what Black and Beach has done. Yeah, you know, Tower Safety is paramount in the industry. And we agree with you very much that there's a need for a common vocabulary, a common expectation among the people that have participated in that industry. We, we got involved very actively with Nate, and I think the whole consortium of companies that you've talked about or organizations. Um, are, are essential to do that. Um, you know, tower safety is just paramount. We, we've implemented at Black and Beach the concept that all we have to do is be safe today and just figure out how to complete every um, job incident free and just build on that day after day. Um, I think that the key is nobody wants to get hurt, but without the proper training, there's a greater likelihood that they will. And so we're, we're focused on that. The other industry trend we've started to see as we track injuries both within our own organization and around the, the country is really a physical fitness challenge within, within the industry in that a lot of the tower climbing um, resources are getting older, not like ourselves who are not getting any older, but um, some of those guys are getting older. 
and, and the physical strain is significant. And that's where I think the career path opportunity is huge, is that in many ways, power climbing is a young person's game. And if you don't provide a career path that shows people how they can transition from what may be a hugely physically demanding job early in their, in their career when they can physically support that to a job that gives them a progression over time, it's not a very attractive career path if you know I can only do this until I'm 35 or 40 or something like that. And so that's where having this program spelled out and for, for veterans and others, I think is really important. It's hard to get a quality work product when a guy thinks he's only going to be around for a year. Yeah, yeah. And the, the demands are huge and it's not easy to, to put up with that every day. When you talk about those kinds of individuals, of course, veterans do come to mind. Uh, but there's all kinds of veterans. Some want to climb towers, some of them might be service disabled and have other other uh, needs that you want to get them in our industry for. And nobody's done more than, than Rosie Cloud and Kelly Dunn to really help bring veterans into the industry in general. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, about what you're doing and uh, Kelly and, and Rosie and talk about how we can have a not just tower climbing and safety, of course, veterans are the most safety conscious uh, and they really improve the quality of the, of the crews that they're on, but also physically able of those who aren't. How are we going to bring that into a whole career, not just a, a, an entry level job in our industry? Yeah, and as Rosie will probably mention, most people in the room know Warriors for Wireless has been an industry wide initiative for two years. And one of the things I'm very proud of is we're told often that this is one of the few industries that's trying to tackle the, the veteran employment and training issue as an industry. And it's taken a ton of collaboration. Um, the key for us is that we started with power climbing because that was the biggest need in working through TIRAC and other organizations were developing multiple tracks for career pathing were heavily involved in, in uh, TIRAC and really seeing that uh, Scott hit on it is that it's not just a job, it's a career. And, and our biggest challenge and biggest reward of Warriors for Wireless the last two years has been you've seen service members coming out and, and they're a little lost and they're underutilized uh, for the tremendous amount of skill set uh, and what they can bring to the table. And what we've done as an industry is created those opportunities, but not just the opportunities, we're trying to create the whole package, and that's the, the training, the certification, and the career pathing. And, and I, I think Rosie and I met two years ago when we first started before the White House launch, and she said something that stuck with me. She said, listen, these are jobs that uh, a large number of veterans need and have to have because they're kinetic, they're active, they're working you know, in teams, they're working with fellow veterans, and there's a tremendous sense of accomplishment with a small cell tower or anything else. You look at the end of the day and say, this is what I've done. And I think that's what we've heard that in droves, and it's, it's very, very powerful. And I think that what we're, we're giving is, and what all of these activities are doing is we're helping professionalize the industry and professionalize the, the workforce and a, a former professional soldier or service member is going to look for that. They don't want to come into an industry where they've got, you know, it's a one-year type of thing and there's nowhere to go. They want to know how I'm measured, how I can I perform, how can I advance, and what do I need to get there? And I think that's one of the things we've done. So I think Helen makes a great point. I mean, the, the national picture on veterans, if you will, is, is, is pretty straightforward. We have about 250,000 veterans leaving the Department of Defense. That number stays constant, peacetime, and wartime. So if you're looking at a steady pipeline of talented individuals, then on a national level, about 90% of Americans are actually eligible to join the military. The number one uh, basically disqualifying factor is frankly the physical attributes that are required to sustain the kind of endurance and commitment to the military. So you are looking at individuals who are not only fit, motivated, kinetic, trained, um, from again, from a national picture, by far, uh, this generation has received some of the best training uh, of all uh, wartime type of forces. And so you have a generation who, once they connect to employment, regardless of industry, regardless of their age, they outperform the general population almost immediately when it comes to economic outcomes. And that's because of what I call the grit factor when we're talking about the veteran population. I mean, they tend to commit, uh, they tend to be very loyal to the company they commit for because they're seeking that outcome and purpose. And so they tend to be a solid vet. Sourcing them, however, and getting them into training tends to be 
what that big question mark. And so most veterans, uh, the VA developed a Veterans Employment Center. We've got uh, every transitioning service member uh, is able to put their resume online in the Veterans Employment Center, whether they're looking for training opportunities or employment. So if it's free, it's available to any business. If you're looking to connect directly to veterans seeking employment, the VA's Veterans Employment Center is the way to go. Uh, second, the Rich GI Bill has been expanded to allow for partnerships, such as what Kelly has done, with registered apprenticeships. So most veterans coming out the door have a GI Bill worth on par to about $200,000, right? And they can use that for higher education, but the vast majority go into upskill, middle skill, or trade types of jobs. And so the, the, the GI Bill of today allows for the apprenticeship program to be topped up in relation to the GI Bill. So that means a wonderful apprenticeship opportunity through an employer, uh, a veteran who may be able to attract a much higher quality veteran because if they exercise the GI Bill, they will get a stipend from their GI Bill on top of that because we want to make sure they're, they're following their passion. And we know that veterans, not only are they entrepreneurial, but they also want to connect to an employment, especially post-service, that they really uh, can see themselves being for the long term. Again, that is kind of one of the stickiness factors of veterans that once they commit and find that right match, they tend to be extremely committed. So we, what you're basically saying is that we have the opportunity to have our workforce trained by federal government dollars essentially that they earn as, as, as soldiers and as service members and that that's one of the benefits that can come out of industry and i understand there's also a new benefit now that they can actually be stationed at a work site that's uh, right could you explain that sure so so the department of defense you know in partnership with the department of labor and va uh last year enacted a new statute called stick skill bridge it's a directive that allows a service member six months before they transition from the military to request an upskilling opportunity, on-the-job training, if you will, in an industry of their choice. And so this allows for the DOD to, while they are on active duty time, to actually upskill into a new job. Uh, the VA's role in this is that we actually have the authority through the transition process to train the technical training track for transition opportunities. So through this track, we amplify opportunities across industries that may be eligible not only for the skill bridge authority, but also for GI Bill. So you can imagine a pipeline where it starts during service as they transition. It can become an apprenticeship program, uh, which is topped up through the GI Bill to provide a meaningful, smooth transition uh, I am excited to hear that your industry is looking at this. Other industries have cracked the code uh, it, with some of these authorities, but this is the first industry that's actually looking at this as a holistic pipeline. So I, I think you have an opportunity to really model what it can look like. And so that's what led the VA when we met with Kelly to establish a formal partnership with Kelly uh, through, a, through a memorandum of understanding uh, so we can help amplify this wonderful opportunity that he's developed for, for veterans. And, and as Rose mentioned, the, so we had a meeting with uh, JBL, JBLM, Joint, uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord in Seattle, Washington, and, and what we, they're leading the charge in this, and they've given us their model to take to 15 other installations. So what I challenge the industry to do is work with W4W and others to build this out, and because we also have an apprenticeship program we develop with TIRAP that fits hand in glove, and, and these 15 installations um, with their garrison commander buy-in, you basically get an employee for six months that's transitioning out of the military on the you know army payroll, for example, while they're learning the skill, while they're uh, you know integrating into the workforce, and then involves a full-time job. It's a phenomenal program, and when they um, announced it, uh, first started talking about a year and a half ago, I thought I was hearing it wrong, but I think it illustrates the military's huge push on these transitioning service members because of the impact of not doing it for our economy, for our industry, for our, for our country is, is huge. Just the unemployment tax alone that we need to be paid if we don't find meaningful, viable careers for these transition veterans. So think a little bit about what Rosie, Gemma, and Kelly are talking about for our end of the situation. Two main things. What do I train the people to? That's what Tyrap's trying to do, is not get, we're not trained. We don't do the training. We're just saying this is what to be, achieve a level this should be. 
So we establish the what. The next thing that comes to is how do I pay for the do? And now we've got an environment to where we have these good men and women that have faithfully served our country and through the efforts of so many now, if we could stop and learn to work together as we're supposed to in this industry, we have an incredible opportunity to thank these people in a way that will help our economy to do nothing but strengthen and raise the technical acumen of all the men and women that do the work in our industry. Yeah, and I think, like Rosie was saying, the steady inflow that's available through through the military, people departing the military is huge because it may help level that peak and valley issue if you know there's a steady workflow or steady flow of people. But Rosie hit the nail on the head. We've got to crack the code like others have. We're on the precipice. It's going to take us working together to achieve what we can. We want to be on the cutting edge of this industry of, of, of taking advantage of these opportunities. And I think nobody's better positioned than veterans to work in our industry. Maybe you can talk just for a minute about why veterans are perfectly suited for, for wireless infrastructure. Me? Um, yeah, so listen, I think they know what right looks like. There's no job they don't believe they can get done. They work tremendously well on the team. And I have a misconception, and Jim and I talked about this when we started the program in Aiken two years ago, is that we started it in near Fort Gordon because we thought it'd be a lot of signal work. Well, there's a lot of other branches of the service that once they understand what to do, this, this current uh, military is a highly sophisticated, highly technical force. No matter if you're 11 Bravo infantrymen or a signal corps guy like I was, they, they get it, they understand it. And so what, what they, they can do is they work very, very well as a team. But they have to have the training in place and they have to have that support infrastructure. And our, our biggest failures or missteps have been when we put these transitioning veterans in environments where that wasn't in place. So I really, you know, this, I, I guess I keep encouraging people having done this for two years, this is hard. It's really worth doing and it's incredibly valuable, but you really have to be all in. This is not something you can be half in as a company, as an industry, because when you get it right and it's done right, it's, it's, it has a, a tremendous impact, not just on the veterans, but on your company as a whole. And I think you gotta have all the peace parts. So we, we see that, that the, the veterans are quick learners, they adapt quickly, they're incredibly loyal, and they want stability, and you're not gonna have the churn, which is another thing that we haven't mentioned, is just the, the, um, the retention and capability that the apprenticeship program offers is huge as well for the industry. I'd like to add one moment, just one nugget, you know, which when we talk about veterans, we kind of uh, almost commoditize the term. Our women veterans are a huge underpinning, and, and we don't do a great job of talking about their success factor. And so uh, the, this generation, candidly, in America is the first generation, as I mentioned, that's outperformed the general population. So let's, let's pause on what those implications are, right? But women veterans historically have always regardless of generation, outperformed the general population. Our women veterans are gritty, they are proven, they, they have, they're up to the task. If you're looking at a pipeline, not only of male veterans, please don't overlook what our women veterans bring to the table because they, they by far uh, are an untapped resource that many employers just quite frankly don't take the time to really understand the sourcing of women veterans. And so oftentimes I think your industry may be, may be missing an opportunity if you're looking at diversification, if you're looking at attracting women to the industry uh, with women veterans. I mean, I, I, so I can't stress that.